All right. Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, welcome again to Discussions with the Fashion Masters. My name is Deanna Hansen. I'm a certified athletic therapist and the founder of Fluid Isometrics and Block Therapy. And I'm being joined by my nephew, Quinn Castellane, the lead block therapist and the VP of block therapy, and our very special guest today, Chris Prado, one of our block therapy instructors. I know that so many of you, your hearts are going to be touched by Chris's story and you're gonna be able to relate to so much that he has to say. So Chris, welcome, thank you so much for joining us and I'm just gonna pass it right over to you. Awesome, thank you, Deanna. Thank you, Quinn, for having me. It's great to be here with you too. And we'll just get started talking about my story. And like you said, it can relate to so many of us, but I feel like so many of us are going through the same thing. And we try to mask it or hide it and just keep going on with our lives without addressing it. And, and you know, part of what we're able to do with block therapy is create that new awareness, right? So, you know, what I've been through in my life has led me to do what I do now, wanting to help other people with their self-care because, Harnessing my self-care is what allowed me to begin to heal. And I think that the healing is an, is an everlasting process, whether it's physical, emotional, um, or spiritual. It all works together. Now, when I was younger, when I was a child, I was morbidly obese. And I didn't struggle with a weight issue. I struggled with emotional issues. I struggled with things that were going on in life and at home and being made fun of at school and things of that nature. And I'll fast forward a little bit to when I was in my mid-teen years. I was I had hit about 265 pounds when I was in middle school. So I was in grade eight, 265 pounds, size 42 waist. I was a big boy. <laughs> and um, I got into high school and I started, I wanted to play football, but I couldn't move quick. And football is a game of speed. And my first year, I didn't play any football. And I knew it was because of my weight. I actually wanted to play football my whole childhood, but I weighed too much to play in the, in the little leagues. I was too big for my age, and I could never join. And, you know, these, these eating habits continued into, into this time of my life where I was eating just to mask how I was feeling. But I didn't realize I was doing that. I wasn't, I didn't make the connection of what was going on. And I also, you know, I, I had moments in my childhood where I was even on things like antidepressants as a, as a young kid, as a child. And this really altered the way that my body was functioning, the way that my brain was working. And it, we were trying to mask something that, you know, we didn't know what the issue was, but lo and behold, I, I, didn't play my first year of playing football. I actually played the, ten, the last 10 seconds of the last game of the season. We lost every game, but the coach put me in. And uh, this same coach was also the weightlifting coach, and he got me into weightlifting. And that's when I kind of fell in love with that. I was actually very strong naturally, I guess from carrying all that weight around. But um, I got into that, and I, I decided to – to really take care of myself. And this was a conscious decision at a young age because I finally realized that nobody was doing it for me. Everybody would tell me I needed to stop eating. Everybody would tell me I needed to do this, but I was still doing what I was doing. And that's when I fell in love with the weightlifting and the bodybuilding. And I'm sure you can relate, Quinn, for a lot of us that, um, that get into bodybuilding at a younger age. It's like your first love. It's something that you, you can see almost instant results from. You see your body morphing and changing. And I went from weighing that 265, almost 270 pounds down to, I remember when I got on the scale and I was 193 pounds and I had, you know, abs, I was built very well and I felt great. And by my sophomore year, I was playing on the varsity team in high school by the end of my sophomore year. And that was huge for me. I made a complete turnaround and I was, you know, I was very active. I was able to feel like I hadn't ever felt before, both emotionally and physically, right? Because when you go through that sort of metamorphosis, a lot of things start changing. The way that you think about life completely changes. Um, but there's still that part of you that still doesn't feel like you've gotten to where you need to get to. And I always had that in me, but you know, I, I kept, I kept my weightlifting. I kept my bodybuilding going. I kept playing football. And then by my junior senior year going into that, I sustained quite a bit of injuries. Um, 
several concussions. I don't, I really don't know how many concussions because there were times where your coach tells you, if you say you're injured, you can't play. So you kind of just don't talk. You don't say anything and, and you continue playing your sport and doing the best you can. And I had a lot of, I had nerve injuries in my neck. I had a lot of stingers. Um, I'm sure anybody that plays contact sports, Quinn's you've played hockey. I don't know mm -hmm. if you've ever had a stinger before, but Definitely. yeah, years later I, I went to a doctor and they said, you should have quit after the first one. And I was getting stingers day in and day out. Like, like it was, you know, like it was nothing. So I kept going. My body was young. And, and to compound all this, I've also, since I was, since I was, I was born with a genetic disorder where it's called paramyotonia congenita. Um, and then the short story of that, where my muscles can't relax quick enough. Uh, I had really severe sensitivity to cold or humid weather and stuff like that. And my muscles won't relax. So I would sustain muscular tears and injuries because my muscles would be fully contracted and my joint keeps moving and it pulls but I, I kept going with this um, this is something that uh, it runs in my family and I was taught to never tell anybody I had anything or I'd be seen differently and just kind of growing up with I don't have this I got to keep pushing through I got to keep pushing through and this caused me to, to sustain a lot of injuries because of my sensitivity to cold I would be weightlifting in in cold rooms and I would feel things kind of tear. And then the next day is when you really feel things. I'm sure you can relate, Quinn, if you've ever had a, a weightlifting injury. You don't necessarily feel it that same day. It's right. the next day where you can't move and you're like, okay, that, that's not right. <laughs> right? That's, yeah. that's not how this is supposed to feel. Um, and when we're young, we are so resilient when it comes to injury and being able to keep moving because everything else is so flexible. So coming out of high school, I kept my weightlifting going. Um, I was always very strong. And then it got to the point where a lot of injuries started catching up with me. And um, I'll fast forward a little bit to my early 20s to where I basically could not move. I would be at a friend's house and I would, my back would spasm up so hard I'd have to lay on the floor at, at their house because my back was just so tight. My shoulder was frozen for two years. It couldn't move above this range of motion. I couldn't put my arm over my head on my left side. Not only that, I had severe nerve pain coming down into my fingers, which felt like fire inside of my arm, uh, running down from, from my vertebrae all the way down. And this just became a normal part of life. And I, you know, I started developing even more emotional issues in terms of um, response to this pain, response to what I was going through. And the, the emotion became more of anxiety and depression, not so much just, um, you know, and I was aware of it. I was aware that something was wrong versus when I was younger, I would just kind of like mask it somehow by eating, by, by acting out and things of that nature. But now I realize that something was wrong and, um, I started going to the doctor for it. And the first thing that doctors do, well, first I was dealing with the pain. I was dealing with pain management, um, cortisone shots, pain medications, um, some therapy here and there, chiropractic therapy, massage therapy, which did help, but not to the extent of releasing the true restrictions of what was going on, both physically and emotionally and, and everything just kind of compounding. And I started making really bad decisions in my life, started doing things I shouldn't do, putting things in my body I shouldn't put in my body. And at that time, I actually gained all that weight back that I had lost throughout that time period. I gained it all back. So here I was back and I had, I weighed even more at this time and I was incredibly unhealthy. And, and at that point in my life, in my early twenties, I lost someone very close to me. He was my best friend. He was my, um, he was like a brother to me, my cousin. And I lost him due to, to the choices that we were both making. And when you lose somebody that unexpected and that quick, it really shakes you up a bit. And, um, you know, I went to a, a rehabilitation center to try to correct what I was doing in my life. I, again, I had one of these moments that I had when I was 14 years old where I said, I have to fix my life. I need to get control of my self-care. And I didn't know how I was completely lost. You know, I was taking medications. I was doing things I wasn't supposed to. 
And I went into this rehabilitation center and that's when I just started having these epiphanies and um, of what I needed to change. And I knew what I needed to change, but what I didn't know was the how. I think a lot of times we can identify the what, but the how is the, how is the actual part <laughs> to the what, right? It's, it's the hard part to figure out and digest and, and figure out how to get there. So I started making changes little by little. I came out of the rehabilitation center. Um, I came out of there on more medication than I went in on, <laughs> which it's funny how the medical system works because you're trying to, we're, we're covering up a bleeding artery here with a Band-Aid. And I immediately stopped everything. And I'm not a doctor. I don't recommend that anybody does that. Um, if you are ever taking any medications like that, but I, that's what I did. And it was harder to completely come off of all of that than it was to just quit little by little. But I had, in my eyes, I had no choice. I needed to take control of my life right now. That was my mindset. And I, I quit my job. I was working, uh, I had a pretty decent job at the time, although I was living this pretty crazy life. I managed to keep a good, decent job and I quit because of the stress, because I needed to rearrange my life somehow. And I got back in the gym. I got back in the gym. I reconnected with one of my old mentors and I started taking control of my nutrition. I completely changed everything I was eating. I stopped eating the McDonald's, the Taco Bell. I stopped really going out to eat, started cooking at home. I developed a plant-based lifestyle and I, I quickly started to lose weight. However, the injuries were still there. The pain was still there. And I was now not just on a quest of, of becoming healthier, but on a quest to get rid of pain. And the pain I started to find was directly correlated with my stress. In times of stress and times of having a panic attack or anxiety attack, the pain would resurface tenfold sometimes. And, um, you know, if, if you've ever had nerve pain or anything that powerful, you don't wish that on anyone. I think nerve pain is probably one of those things mm -hmm. where you, you feel and it just, it stops everything. And it doesn't matter what kind of nerve pain. It could be something going into your legs and your mouth and your arm and your shoulder and your neck. It just, it's one of those things where it's undescribable. So I, I began to just sort of learn my body, trying to create body awareness, um, really going light in what I was doing. I wasn't doing heavy lifting like I was before. And I started to treat my body with a lot of love. I started to love myself tremendously. I was, I was you know, there was times where I wanted to die before and just, I wanted to give up and, and let life just end. However, I, I didn't see that as an option anymore. I started seeing life as something that I wanted to live and not just get by in. And you know, fast forward here a little bit. I moved to Nicaragua. I, I went out there to build a surf lodge after a couple years of working. And that is where I met Grace Van Berkham of Glow, who completely rocked my world in many ways, but also in, in a way of nutrition. Um, she is a holistic nutritionist. And this is where I really took my grasp on nutrition. And then I started realizing how much that impacted my mental health. My mental health was already changing based on what I was eating. My body was responding in ways that I hadn't seen before. Um, I was feeling better. I was eating better. And once I started really honing in on, on nutrition at a cellular level and, and developing these new skills of not just how to eat, but when to eat, what to combine, what foods. This was really important. And I ended up moving to, to Grace's retreat center, GLOW, in northern Nicaragua, where I was introduced to block therapy. Block therapy just kind of walked itself into my life, right? And Grace, actually, she practiced with Rachel in the Bahamas, and Grace brought me a block from the Bahamas, and she said, you got to try this. You got to try this block. And I look at this block and I, I kind of laugh, right? I, I giggle because I'm like, Grace, what is this wood? I thought it was a decoration of some kind because it had the, the awesome logo on it. I thought she was just going to put it on the shelf. I really didn't know what it was. And she says, you should really try this for your pain because I hadn't been able to shake the pain. I had not been able to, to, to find something. And in that quest, I had tried foam rollers countless, you know, thousands of dollars in chiropractic and massage treatment and just trying to find a way to, to fix this pain. 
And she got me on the block um, and sort of repeated a little bit of a class that, that she had done with Rachel. She's like, look, this is how you do it. Make sure you're breathing. And I started breathing and I, and I felt, felt weird, a good, very, very good weird, um, a relaxed, weird feeling. I said, okay. So Rachel came to GLOW to host a block therapy retreat. And I was able to do this for three hours a day for a week. And that's when I really felt it. I would say after the, the first or, or probably the first class, I was feeling really sleepy. And then the second class, I was falling asleep in almost every position um, because we did a, I'll never forget, we did the core class first, which is a little bit more interesting because you're, you're on your ribs and you're on, on different areas where you're feeling it and, and it kind of doesn't let you fall asleep. But when we started doing the head, neck, and arms, and I was working in positions that were directly affected by these injuries, working in my shoulder, in my neck, and stuff like that, I was nodding off. And what I realized was happening was that for the first time in my life, and, and this, since I had had these injuries, I was feeling real relief. And it was a relief where I was being touched the way that I needed to, and I was doing it. It wasn't someone else that was doing this to me. It was me. It was me laying on this block, which I thought was a decoration that I laughed at, and it was bringing me this incredible amount of relief, and I couldn't believe it, and I'm sure like many people that have practiced block therapy, you, you kind of get a tear forming, right, and I've had lots of tears form on the block, releasing different things. However, this was a, a, a tear of pure happiness because I was like, wow, this is incredible. I, I had never, I hadn't felt that. I didn't know what that felt like. And we're talking 10 years of, of chronic pain, right? Which you kind of just block off. You kind of just forget about and it's there, but it's always there, which is the problem. And our mind is very good at, at forgetting about that chronic pain and putting it off. But that is, and that's how my block therapy journey began. And I was, I was about to start training to become a yoga teacher, but the yoga was always painful for me. It was always painful. I, could, I would do a downward dog and my shoulder would start hurting. And that is when I said, you know what, I am going to, I'm going to be a block therapy instructor. This is what I was meant to do. I felt that because this is what I needed. And that is kind of where it all started. And I, I um, went through the program and I started teaching abroad. I've taught in many different countries and I started seeing the same face that I had that I could imagine what it looked like. I started seeing on other people and that's when I realized how powerful this practice was, not just for what it did for me, but that me as one person could set off a ripple effect, helping hundreds and thousands of people with just this block. And I wasn't doing anything. I was, I was guiding them, but they're doing it for themselves which is the beauty of this practice is that you are doing it for yourself. And, and in all of this, the real um, realization was how fascia works in the body and what we really need to treat that we are, we're only for the most part treating symptoms. We're not treating causes. We always talk about cause sites and pain sites and the cause site is really what we want to go after. And there's nothing out there like block therapy that addresses these things. And I think the, the best part about it is that you're doing it for yourself. And this was my journey all along was what can I do for myself to help me get out of this place, to help me love my body again? Because that, that's the whole thing is loving ourselves. I never liked the way I looked until I stopped caring what people think. But that, that, was, a, that was a hard thing to overcome. And I think we all uh, have this to a degree where, where we feel that we don't look the part, but we can't begin that journey of healing or becoming what we want to be until we love what we are in that current moment. And, you know, part of what block therapy has done was get me to that point of really loving myself because getting rid of the pain was a big part of it. I hated myself for having that pain. I regretted every minute of it. And now I find myself, I'm still constantly working on my body and, and figuring things out and creating this awareness. But being able to live pain-free is living free. And pain comes in many different forms, right? Pain can be that you're unhappy with the way that you look. 
that is a pain. Pain doesn't have to be something that, that feels like a burn or a break in a bone or your muscle is sore. Pain is something that also exists in our mind. And we're able to move through that pain when it comes to working through fascial restrictions and block therapy. And I think that's been, you know, probably the, the single greatest practice to come into my life is the block therapy. And the beauty of it is that, like I said, I'm doing it to myself. And I think so many people can benefit from this. And um, I just want to take a, a moment to thank you, Deanna and Quinn, because you two have been my mentors in all of this. Um, many times from afar, but it has been a wonderful journey so far. And I'm looking forward to, you know, a lot of self-discovery and, and helping people along this path. Well, Chris, uh, thank you so much for sharing. Like I'm honestly, like I've got goosebumps listening to you because I can personally relate to so many things you're saying for me. Um, the anxiety pain was so much more profound than the physical pain, which is really why this practice became something that, I was able to develop and share because I mean, I, I just, I hated myself for so many years and I hated the way that I felt inside as a result of that. And then my behaviors from eating disorders to alcoholism, to all of the things that I did to mask what I wanted to do. I realized with my eating disorders, I did of course lose weight in the beginning with my eating disorders. Um, but it was really that self-control that I was seeking as opposed to the weight loss because, you know, as time went forward and, you know, I started with other behaviors that definitely took me into negative places, I would remember back to those moments when I had the strength to starve. Like how, how bizarre, right? Like our mind is so yeah. complex yeah. and strange, but I was like longing for the strength to be able to starve so that I... I could get back to that, that body that I wanted, but it was that control piece. And it, for me, it was diving my hand into my belly and, and connecting with that pain that made me feel so finally in control because mm -hmm. I could control that. And that in turn was the beginning of that whole piece of self-love for me. So thank you so much for sharing. Like your, mm. your story is, is truly phenomenal. And I know already you have touched and reached so many people all over the world. You share some beautiful testimonials all the time. Quinn, I'm sure you want to chime in here. Yeah, like again, I, I didn't know many of these things that you just explained. This is such an incredible, inspiring story, Chris. Wow. And um, yeah, I, I can relate not to everything you, you've mentioned, um, but to many things you have mentioned and, um, from the bodybuilding to the body dysmorphia, even like people would look at me and say, why would you ever have body dysmorphia? Like you're you used to bodybuilder, you're a bodybuilder, you compete this and that, but people don't understand the whole mental aspect of things. And, um, I, I love how you were talking about and what Deanna just mentioned as well about pain, like pain is a savior in so many ways. If it's something we're consciously looking for. Again, chronic pain is one thing, but pain can be very grounding and it can pull you out of bouts of anxiety or depression. And whenever I'm going through a funk, like everybody experiences anxiety to some degree. Everybody probably experiences depression to some degree. Um, and whenever we're in those states, it's, it's the block that will save me every time. It's, it's so weird. And, and I'm not just saying that as a selling feature. It's just true. Like what else is there really to use? Um, because substances obviously aren't the answer. Um, it's, it's self-care. It's connecting to the breath. It's connecting to the pain in our body that will help distract us from the anxiety, but not even just distract us from the anxiety, to actually find the anxiety trapped in our body and to breathe that out, connect back to our breath. And um, yeah, like we, th this is an interesting journey, just where we're on right now, just with block therapy and there's anxiety behind it. There's, there's mm -hmm. times of frustration and it's, it's really hard to control. And the, the answer is seriously connecting to yourself. And that's where the Sorry. answers are. And everybody looks at for other people or, or other places for these answers. But as soon as you connect in, then you understand. And a lot of people always refer to, oh, I got to go to this person to help me. Oh, I got to go to this person to help me. And don't get me wrong. There's people that can tremendously um, help each individual. But when it comes to a daily basis practice, you need something that you can rely on and count on for yourself. And that's block therapy. 
that's exactly what this is. And it's, it's a journey and an experience for every individual. It's going to be different for every single person. And that's what I love about it. We're going to have many similarities. Some people like, oh, I, I rid my chronic pain, my chronic back pain. Those are similarities. But everybody's journey is going to be different. And that's what makes everybody's story so unique. And like, Chris, your story, like, I had no idea either. I was like, holy smokes, like, this is incredible. And just to, to like, I've just never heard you, you say it and especially say it like that. And again, I'm just blown away. And I am so happy that you're here, that you found block therapy and you're, you're a teacher, like you're an instructor. This is so cool. You're going to inspire <laughs> literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people without a doubt um, with your journey and just speaking through experience. And that is the best way to speak and to teach and to inform people is through experience. And, and you have some of the, the best experience. <laughs> Thank you, Quinn. You know, the, the struggle is what makes us, right? The, the struggle builds us up and, and gives us knowledge. I think what, what we struggle through is what gives us wisdom and knowledge, but that's all useless if we don't share it. Right. You just keep it for yourself. You can't share it. And, um, you know, I just wanted to touch on something that is really important. My drug of choice is wood. It's a block, right? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I can say that now, right? And what, what we feel when we do block therapy on, on a scientific level, on a physical level of what's going on in the body is the same thing that happens when we use drugs, when we use substances, when we use things that we're trying to mask things in our body. We are doing with the block what those things do. It's a natural pain reliever. When you can get in touch with your breath, when your digestive system is working properly, when the toxins are leaving your body, you are creating almost a euphoric state in your body. And I'm sure a lot of you, both of you see this a lot and, and all the other block therapists and block therapy instructors, you see people when they start working especially working in the head and the neck and deep in the core and stuff like that, they kind of get into this, you know, mode where their eyes are closing and they're sort of in this, in this trance, right? I don't know if trance is the right word for it, but that, that's what I see. And it's like something is happening in your body. There is, you know, there are your, your receptors are going off in your, in your brain in a certain way and, and things are being activated. Your serotonin is pumping because you are naturally inducing these things. And the reason that our body stops producing these hormones and different things that make us feel like that is because of blockages, blockages in our fascia that doesn't allow it to work effectively, especially in our gut. You know, they say that over, over three fourths of our serotonin is produced in our gut, in our digestive system. And that's one of the first, the first position in every block therapy class is right smack dab in mm -hmm. your belly. Mm -hmm. And what are we doing? We're stimulating our digestive system, our lymphatic, our lymphatic system, the things that are, are going to allow our, our mind to feel the way it wants to feel. So, you know, we go, f we can use this as a tool. And like you said, Quinn, it's, it's, it's not a selling feature, but why wouldn't you want to try something like this? Something so simple that you can do anywhere. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I've, I've done this in airports. I've done, pulled my block out in the airport and, and got right on it and, just killed stress that way or at home. Mm -hmm. And, and it's something that you can do, even if you only have five minutes in that day, you can practice block therapy. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something huge to, because a panic attack might, the, the actual panic attack or an anxiety attack or, or a bad feeling might last for 30 seconds, but it knocks you off sometimes for, for days or weeks. One, one bad moment can knock you off for days or weeks. Um, but just like Deanna, in, in your inception moment of discovering this, when you put those hands in your belly and, and you came into contact with the pain, if we, can, if we can cut the head off the snake right there, if we can stop the, the, the panic attack or the anxiety from happening and hit the pain and find the pain and, and stop being scared of the pain, you know, the opposite of fear is love right? And it's that self-love that we're seeking. Because when we don't like how we look, when we look in the mirror and we don't like how we look or we don't like how we feel, it's fear. 
It's nothing but fear. Fear of someone looking at us and thinking of us a certain way. Fear that you don't feel good about yourself. Fear of going out in public and being seen. Uh, fear of not being able to perform adequately. Um, and I think that's something that we have to get through is the fear. And I think too that, um, you know, I, I often mention that we need to love ourselves as much as we need to love ourselves because our cells make up ourselves. And all of us want to be heard. All of us want to be given what we need to feel like we are worthy. And I see the cells as being the same. Every single cell in the body is communicating and working synchronously to create a body that can move and thrive and create and do all of the wonderful things that we want to do. But each and every cell also has a voice. And wherever there's those blockages, we aren't able to hear what those cells are saying. So they start, they start getting a little louder. And at first, that symptom or sensation may be pain. And likely it will be pain because it's not going to get our attention through pleasure. Pain is going to make us wake up mm. and say, hey, something, something's going on here. We need to do something. But unfortunately, we've been trained to ignore that, to mask it, to avoid it in some way, shape, or form rather than embracing it and saying, this isn't scary. There's nothing to fear about pain. We need to love the pain. And then if we give those cells what they need, they start responding with action and with health and with allowing the body to do the things that we weren't able to do, whether that's moving a shoulder in its full range of motion or feeling calm enough so that we can express ourselves fully or being creative enough that we can, you know, find the passions and the gifts that we've all been given to share with the world. So I, I, I love that because when I've been going through this process now for 20 years, in the beginning when I was really trying to make sense of it, I would look to the the laws of the universe to say, okay, like what, what's making sense here? And one of the things that I always loved was that everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. So if something is happening in the body, it's happening in the cell. If something's happening in the body, it's happening in the universe. So it's, it's, it's an, a simple way to make something really complicated, really simple. And I mean, that's how I really started understanding that the way that we age is based on the Fibonacci sequence. It's based on the spiral pattern of everything in nature because everything in nature, the architecture of flowers, of the galaxies, of how the body forms is based on that Fibonacci sequence as is the way that the body ages. And we spiral and we wind down and we grip and adhere. So when we can follow that pattern in the tissue, which is how we direct people through twisting and turning and opening with the breath then we can release those blockages and we can start to communicate with those cells that are deeper than what we are consciously aware of. So it's like we're giving hugs to all these little kids that have been ignored and we're sending them love and it's, it's our body though. So, um, so thank you for sharing that. I love that. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And there's so many cells, right? So we got we to gotta prepare a lot of hugs and love to give. There, there is a lot of them. But uh, with enough true? love, we can get to all of them. Absolutely. 100%. Um, I'm just looking at some of the comments and questions here. So before I pull up this other question, I'm just going to bring this one here that is more um, uh, in relation to our conversation now. So struggle builds us. Love that how empowering. I'm witnessing real meaning of sharing is caring with block therapy. Um, 100% love that. Thank you, Kat, for yeah, that. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm really interested in the Fibonacci sequence and body relationship. It's a, that's Deanna and I talk about the Fibonacci sequence so much and how, um, cause when you think of it and Deanna can explain this better than I, but how so many things form, how galaxies form, it's all in that Fibonacci sequence. But Deanna really explains that that's how the fascia grips onto bone and seals us. Um, Deanna, actually, do you want to share that? Because that's super interesting. Um, just from that fascia perspective, how is, because we were just talking about everything in the universe is a mirror of itself. So if that's the case, and we talk about, I believe it's either the golden sequence or I, we call the it the Fibonacci. spiral. Yeah. Right, right. And we call it the Fibonacci sequence. Um, can you just explain a little bit on how that works in our body and how that pulls us down and adheres into bone in that spiral fashion. So th this, that's the Fibonacci sequence. So it's, it's really cool because basically the Fibonacci sequence is the architecture. The golden mean spiral is the energy that travels through the architecture. So 
when we are open and spacious and there's nothing blocking flow, energy travels as a wave. So for example, if you're getting um, reflexology or acupuncture, uh, part of the goals is to send a wave through the tissue, through the body so that we can activate something at a distance or we can open up blockages. Um, and as long as there's no blockages, energy will travel in that wave. As soon as we have a block to that wave, the first thing that's going to happen is the energy is going to start to spiral because that is the architecture of everything in nature and how the energy is going to move around that. And um, both Quinn and I, we, we live in an apartment building and there's a river right below us. And I've lived here now for 14 years and I have seen many years, 14, where the river has thawed and frozen and thawed and frozen. And it's so interesting because ultimately we are a fluid matrix. We're not a solid piece of tissue. We, we are fluid and we're made up of particles that make us look like a form. But in fact, we are simply a fluid filled matrix. So we want to keep this fluid flowing in the, in the tissue. But just like in the river, what I see every year, there's a tree that extends from the bank into the river. So in the middle of the river, I can see the foam flowing down like a wave. As it starts approaching this tree, which would be like a block in the body from scar tissue, from injury surgery or compression, all of that foam starts to get pulled in to that tree and you can see it starting to spiral. But mm -hmm. then as it gets in there you can see just chaos and it reminds me exactly of when i used to work in a bar when i was 18 years old and that was when people smoked in bars so i mean you know we'd have nights where there was hundreds of people smoking in this bar and you could see the streams of chaos at the top of the ceiling with the smoke and how it would just intermingle and basically become chaotic but if you watch smoke leaving a pipe there's the wave, then it starts to spiral, then it turns to chaos. So under the chaos is the spiral, under the spiral is the wave, which takes us back to the source. So ultimately, regarding the Fibonacci sequence in the body, as soon as we start to tip or grip off balance, and we're creating that block, again, from injury, surgery, or just compression from incorrect posture over time, we are now pulling energy. So they're called um, energy cysts. I first learned that term in cranial sacral therapy and I've read it in other things, but basically it's like a black hole. So we have this dense dam that starts pulling our energy into that, in that spiral pattern, and it's going to grip and continue to pull more and more and more in. So as it gets thicker and denser, it becomes more powerful, like a gravity. And if we don't do something to release that, then it's just going to continue to drag us down. And I mean, often we'll see somebody that it, it seems strange because they seemed healthy and then boom, their body is riddled with cancer. Like how does that happen that we go from one place of health or seeming health to a place of being incredibly sick to the point where we might die. And it's ultimately that Fibonacci sequence because over time it gains more and more and more with every pass of the wave It's gaining more momentum and more power until eventually the body is so out of alignment that there's so many blocks That there simply isn't any flow to these cells and cells with no flow Pain aging disease and ultimately death is created from compression So what we need to understand is that compression moves in the pattern of the Fibonacci sequence. So in order to release that compression, we want to tap into those seams of time, which is how we direct people on the block through that spiral pattern so we can open up that tissue and resume blood and oxygen flow to cells. Exactly. Exactly. I was just going to say that's why we instruct so much to torque and spiral into the block because don't get me wrong initially we talk about just isometrically laying in a position which is great that's going to really help heat the tissue will help release the tissue but to really release those deep grips we need to move in the form of how energy moves which is in a wave in a spiral so um again great question and great comment cat um, and she said, thank you. I also believe if our cells are free of adhesions, our spine could backbend like a seashell in Fibonacci. Spinal flexibility is youth and block therapy really helps. Mm, nice. Awesome. Um, I got another question here. Chris, how long did it take you to notice a difference in you from your first block therapy session? About 10 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's why. Because in block therapy, 
um, you know, the block and the position that we're in only accounts for, I don't want to, it's not small, it's not insignificant, it's very significant, but the most significant part of this practice is reconnecting with our breath, in my opinion, um, because our breath is our life. That is the life force. That is what keeps us going. You can't live without breathing. And the moment I started connecting into my diaphragm, I realized where I was lacking. Coming from a competitive weightlifting background, I wasn't a fan of using weightlifting belts. And I was somebody that would put 550 pounds on a bar and squat it. But the way that I would do that was to compress my pelvic floor, my diaphragm, and all my abdominal muscles to create what is the natural weightlifting belt that's within our body. So by nature, by my second nature was to tighten up my core. When I walked, when I ran, when I was playing any sports, anything I did physically, I would, I would tighten up that core. So I spent years, years not properly breathing, not using my diaphragm the way that it was supposed to. And that's what started creating this, this collapse in my body which throws you off balance completely, especially when you're not using that diaphragm. So to answer that question, I felt it immediately. And not to say that I, that I was able to breathe with my diaphragm immediately because I wasn't. That takes some time. I'm still working on that. I'm still working on consciously doing it. I go for, so I go for long walks, right? This has been my, my current way of, of meditating as well as going for long walks. I started realizing that I was I needed to do things with a little bit more intention and slow down a little bit. And in those walks, I have incorporated that deep diaphragmatic breath, that breathing in through the nose, because even when I walk on a normal basis or if I bend over, I tighten up that diaphragm. I tighten up my core. I don't let it use itself like it's supposed to. And that's really, you know, one of the main supports of our body is being able to breathe through things. So I felt it immediately because I tried to breathe and I couldn't. In fact, my body started shaking. When I first got on that block on my belly, my body started shaking as, and I felt all kinds of things pulling and it was very interesting. It was very interesting. And um, it's, it's something that happens right away. And it also, it, you start to become aware. The awareness is, is the single greatest gift you give yourself of being aware of your body, of what you're feeling. And I think, and every, and I'm not just saying this either as a selling feature of the block, but every single soul that has laid on that block in front of me has seen an instantaneous difference. And if you, if you can just see how you're moving before you get on the block and then analyze that right afterward, you will notice a difference. I, I can guarantee it. I, I guarantee it. I'm sure you uh, Quinn and Deanna, you would guarantee it as mm -hmm. well because you've seen it 100%. with everyone. Yeah. But um, even even if it is the belly position, and for a lot of my people at home that don't have blocks or that have done classes with me and don't have a block, what I always tell them, I'm like, hey, if you don't have a block, find something to lay on under your belly. Roll up a towel, fold it up like the block, and lay on it and breathe. And just do that until we meet again, until you can get on the block again. And that is the, you know, that is such a significant thing to be able to reconnect with that. Well, it comes Absolutely. back to, it comes back to Deanna, how, how you came up with this of putting your, your, your fists in your belly, you know, just shoving your hands in your belly and, and breathing. Um, that's what, that's what mm -hmm. creates that, those releases in our body, the heat in the body. And that was really, you know, how block therapy came to be in the beginning there, there's, a, there's a couple of different components to that, but I'd be working with patients and I would see the patient. And by the end of the treatment, I knew that that patient was breathing from the belly. Then I would see them the next week and there was no awareness of diaphragmatic breathing. So that was part of this process for me was how can I create some kind of tool to ensure that between treatments, people are doing something to keep this breath working because the diaphragm is such a unique muscle in that it's the only muscle that's under both our conscious and unconscious control. And we all know how busy life can get. And if we're not consciously thinking about something until we turn that into a habit, it's not going to be right in the forefront and we're going to breathe anyway. So it's not like we're going to 
die if we aren't conscious breathers, but we are completely physiologically a different animal when we're diaphragmatically breathing and when we're not. So the block initially became simply this tool to send people home with to make sure that by the next time I saw them that they were breathing diaphragmatically. But then very quickly I'm thinking, well, you know, fluid isometrics is the technique that block therapy is based on. So I'd be working with my hands, holding my holding the patient's tissue for, you know, three to five minutes at a time. And I'm thinking, well, it doesn't just have to be the belly. Why can't we lie on the ribs and do all of this other stuff? So um, that, that was how this whole thing began with my patients. And then realizing that patients don't need my hands. They simply need to have the instruction to not be afraid of the pain. Because, I mean, as we as instructors, I think that's really one of the biggest things for us to do is to guide people because that fear is such a stopper. And we know that people are so caught up in what's going on in their body. And especially for people in a lot of chronic pain, they think, well, I'm not going to lie on this hard piece of wood. Are you nuts? I'm already in pain. Why would I want to do that to my body? Yet once you do, as you've so beautifully shared, like it's, it's this awareness that immediately you have that there's something happening here. There's something profound and it's a connector. It's, it's a bridge to your higher self, to your mm -hmm. cells Correct. that are currently blocked. And, and those, those who are in chronic pain, I find they're the ones who really, really love getting on the block because th they will do anything to get out of pain as well. So they will resonate with it so well because A, you're already in pain, but they know immediately the difference between searching for pain and pain that's going to heal them compared to the chronic pain that they already have. And that's just something I've noticed because a lot of people, if they're just coming in for just trying to um, test out a, a new, maybe like healthcare practice or self-care practice, initially they, they do have to understand the concept of pain a little bit more because it's, it's, it's new to them. It's like, why am I, I, I don't, I don't physically have really much pain in my body. What's, what's the point of searching for more? But it's like, you, you don't understand how much pain that you're unconsciously aware of that's actually trapped in your body that we need to rid now. And it's not just from the perspective of pain, it's from the perspective of, of everything. And um, again, that comes back to the whole journey. Everybody's journey is going to be different um, with block therapy. But and from a science perspective, the reason that lying on this tool feels so nice to that pain is because the pressure fibers are larger in the body in diameter than the pain fibers. So many of us, if we hurt ourselves, we unconsciously are just going to go and rub it because intuitively it feels good to do that. So as we are allowing that block to sink deeply into our tissue, Combined with that breath, we are connecting to those pressure fibers. And the difference being also that it's through the process of spending time on the block. If you're in pain and you poke something really quickly, you're just going to aggravate the pain. If you take the time and you connect the breath, and that, as Chris, you've mentioned, the key is the breath. You connect the breath to that pain. Now you are in control of that pain and those pressure fibers become activated so now it becomes what people typically describe as a good pain and one that you want to continue to search for because, again, pain isn't the issue. It's, it's the fear that causes that pain, fear spiral to ramp up, just like the Fibonacci sequence. The more pain, the more fear, and then it gets, we like spiral very quickly into this knot where we're like, oh my gosh, I'm just going to freeze up. I can't stand anything. And then we cease all movement. And then we're literally a frozen body and through the process of connecting into those pressure fibers and releasing and melting and exhaling out those adhesions and all of the negativity that's stored in our tissue, physical and emotional, then we create that space so that we can open up that tissue for flow and love again. Correct. And, and you know, something that's, I mentioned this earlier is being able to do this to yourself because when you have pain somewhere or you have a restriction somewhere, especially in the areas that we work on in block therapy, um, our rib cage, you know, areas, maybe let's say in the armpit areas where you're normally ticklish, right? A lot of people don't understand what being ticklish is. You're, you being ticklish is a response to your body trying to protect that area. There's something vital in there that your body is trying to protect and doesn't want to be touched. That is why you, you jolt away or you're getting a massage and someone goes to touch you in an area where you've been injured or your hips, somewhere where you might store emotional pain and your body automatically moves away. 
you're not even thinking about this. Your body is, is creating that reaction. When, when we ourselves get on the block, you don't have that sort of reaction. Um, you know, you know, Deanna, when you're performing body work on someone and let the hip flexors are really common part or anywhere near the armpit or even the neck. These are very, these are areas where a lot of vital things to your body lives. The rib cage, especially um, something I like to do with a lot of my clients first before we work on the ribs is I have them touch their ribs and then I touch their ribs and you can see them move away immediately. And being able to find that trust and do it yourself is a huge part of this. And that's why I think block therapy is so successful because we're completely skipping over that part of fear, that fear in of itself, the body fearing, right? We are able to dive right into where the pain is and begin that, that discovery journey immediately. And it starts to loosen up, you know? Yeah. I love that. The first time I worked on, um, my 18 year old who had fractured his foot. So this was the first time I actually worked on a patient with a fracture, not following the typical road that I was trained to follow. So he was six days into his fracture and it was a very severe uh, fourth metatarsal fracture that he had. So when I started working on him, I, wor- I started, of course, in his core to get his breath going. And then I worked toward the site. So I worked through the leg. I opened up all the channels until I got to the foot. Then I started working on the foot, which was very tender. And one of the things that I had him doing was rather than me moving his foot in any kind of range, I just put my hand up as a, as a wall. And I said, okay, you push into my hand. And it was amazing because in no time at all, he was pushing with so much pressure into my hand. And it was just so profound, the fact that he wasn't afraid. I mean, if I was the one pushing his foot, as you said, he'd be pulling away. But because I gave him the power and allowed him to do the work so quickly, and before I knew it, like within five, 10 minutes, I had him standing up. And then I had him pushing into the floor. And then he started very consciously walking through this on this fracture. And so it was like that eye-opening experience of when you empower people to take control and you take that fear out of the equation, it's a game changer in how we can manage pretty much everything. Quinn, I see you're laughing. I'm, I'm, I'm <laughs> laughing because like you've got me so many times with that, D. Oh, it's hilarious because like... If, if we're working on each other, Deanna is working on me and especially like when I was prepping for a, a show or, or whatever the case was, <laughs> Deanna, whenever I was in so much pain, Deanna would always put the control in my hands. She would say, okay, well, instead of me just driving in here, how about you just apply however much pressure you can? And then I just start applying more and more and then I'm like, ah, I know what she did here. And I finally caught on to it. I'm like, that's brilliant. It's so brilliant to do that, to put the control in the patient's hands. And mm-hmm. that's what block therapy is doing. You, you are the patient, but you are the therapist simultaneously. So you're fully in control of everything. Um, yeah, that, that's why I was laughing because Deanna's gotten me so many times and I, and I still laugh every time <laughs> she does that. Um, but I'm just going to look at some of the comments and questions here. Uh, so this is a great comment from Janelle. I cannot describe to you enough how inspiring this, this discussion is. A thousand thanks to you three and the people before for doing this. This is pure love you're spreading and I appreciate you immensely. Aw, so, so nice. So incredible. And um, I'm just going to read a few more comments here and then we have a question about surfing that we're going to pop up. So we'll switch gears in a sec here. So Oh yeah, pain been there. Block on blocks my new drug. Right on. Uh, <laughs> Choice of drug. Wood. <laughs> Wood's the, the new drug. Pain's the new drug. Hilarious. Yes. Uh, we'll have to connect, Chris. The next time my wife Tammy uh, and I are in Orlando. Great story. So that's Tammy and Barry Gibson. Absolutely, we'll we'll connect you guys. Yes. Uh, so we're going to go to these questions from Rachel Averly. She, I, I just wanted to save these questions after that uh, main discussion we had here because this is really interesting. And Chris, I know you and I can geek out a lot about fitness and stuff like that. Maybe that's for a, another discussion or something. Yes. But, um, Rachel's uh, my block mama. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. So her question is, how does block therapy help you surfing? And I can see a surf camp featuring block therapy in the future. 
you know, so when it comes to any sport, right, um, there is a huge dynamic of what our body does. Something, so for example, I used to play football, a hard contact sport where you're moving forward. You almost never move side to side. There's not a lot of, you know, hips turning and stuff like that. You're moving forward. You're just going at somebody as hard as you can and then you're stopping. When it comes to something like surfing, you're including dynamics in your joints that aren't normal and there's a lot of hard twists and turns and almost always in the same direction, right? Kind of like snowboarding or skateboarding, you're 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 standing sideways and you're kind of like twisting your body in a way which causes you to to lock up, right? So, you know, being able to open up that side that you're constantly going into, you know, spiraling into again, like Deanna said, we're spiraling into it. We're always going into that. And you'll notice, you know, especially as a weightlifter, Quinn, there are probably times in your normal everyday life where you perform movements as if you're lifting a weight, as if you're at the gym, you know, like you bend over and I used to practice my lifts without weight. I would just practice, you know, squeezing my muscles and seeing where it goes. And I think people that surf also do the same thing. I didn't start surfing until I moved to Nicaragua. I went to build a surf lodge and never surfed. So I just, you know, I went with a buddy of mine who was a big surfer and we were actually able to progress a lot with him because his body sat like this. He literally was, and he surfed nonstop. And I could tell in his body by the way that he stood on his board, what was going on. So we did a lot of work on him, and um, he was able to to really benefit significantly and, and start to align. And um, he had even started to develop scoliosis. He had gone to a chiropractor and, and had started to develop that curve in his spine and didn't know why, was told that that's just, you know, his genetics basically is what, you know, he was told that his body was just like that. But as we all know, that's not. This is, we are creatures of habit, but sometimes our habits are very detrimental to our body. And being able to reset that and get in there. And I think, you know, there's a block therapy program for golf. I think golf is very similar because you're constantly mm-hmm. torquing into one side. And a lot of sports are like that, where we we create this dominance that overtakes one side of our body and throws us completely out of whack. And it and what's beautiful about block therapy is that we can reverse these things quicker than it took to happen. Because you may have been doing something for, for, you know, five or 10 years as an amateur surfer, a golfer, or a sport that was throwing your body to one side. And we can reverse that a lot quicker than it took to happen. That's a beautiful thing about the body. When you give it what it needs, it will perform the way it needs to. So, you know, I, I think that's really important to know as well. But yeah, I think, uh, I think not just with surf camps, I think block therapy should be incorporated in every sport. And and something about this practice is that why wait till you are in this place of restriction? Why wait till body failure, organ failure, till your systems are not working correctly in your body? I think, you know, the future of block therapy is not just in, in helping you heal, but preventing the actual injury and preventing these, these ailments happening to our body. You know, from from not being able to sleep to anxiety to, you know, having one side of your body lower than the other to having chronic pain. These issues can all be avoided. Had I known about block therapy before I got into weightlifting, before I started playing contact sports and moving my body in the wrong ways, I probably wouldn't be in the position I am now. But then again, I wouldn't have discovered block therapy the way that I did. But I think, you know, our mission now um, is to show people how to how to prevent these things bring the self-care to the table before the injury comes to it and, and help people get there. And, and this is not in, you don't, you know, you have professional athletes that don't have this level of self-care that don't have this knowledge. You have people playing in the, in the NBA and in the NFL that don't have this and they're, you know, they're tearing Achilles tendons, which shouldn't happen in a, in a person. That's a very strong piece of equipment you have in there. That shouldn't just tear or rupture, you know, but with, and, and just the way that the fascia works, it's, it's part of everything. It's not just, it's not individual, you know, your body would be goop if there wasn't fascia. So being able to, to maintain that and and create the proper maintenance programs and the self-care is going to prevent these injuries from happening. And that's where I'm really starting to, to see this going. And I think Quinn, I think we've chatted about this Deanna as well, how, 
you know, integrating this into everyone's preventative care is going to be huge in the future as it is right now. I have a lot of people that I'm working with that are using it um, that aren't injured, that aren't suffering with chronic pain that don't necessarily have an injury. So this doesn't have to be for people that are already injured or have dysfunction in their body. This can be for anyone. And I think that's a beautiful thing about block therapy. I just want to add to regarding the whole concept of the pace at which we can heal because I mean, people might say, well, I've had this chronic injury for 40 or 50 years. I'm 70 years old. And, you know, can I start this process and like, how long will it take to undo things? What's really interesting about the fascia is, as we've mentioned, it really comes down to flow. It, com it comes down to tissue temperature. So when we combine the movement of the diaphragm to turn on that internal furnace, which ultimately is going to help to heat every single part of the body and to be able to send that blood and oxygen flow to every single cell in the body, then as we continue to heat the body in general, the flow improves. So it doesn't matter if you've had a nice cube in a freezer for one day or 20 years, if you put it in a warmer temperature, it's going to start to melt. And it's going to start to melt right away once you turn up the temperature. So mm -hmm. that's the nice piece about this as well is you can be years and years and year, years riddled with adhesions, scar tissue, chronic pain, or you can be somebody simply coming onto this and understanding, wow, I can actually use this to prevent all of those things. And either way, it's going to benefit you. So I just wanted to add that in um, just so that people understand how profound the melting component is and why we can, we can undo very quickly chronic pains that have happened from you know, decades ago. And, you know, not just pain, dysfunction of organ systems, right? I had yeah. a client come to me that used an inhaler every single day. He used an inhaler every single day. In two classes, he was jogging. In two block therapy classes, we did a lot of focus around the heart, the sternum, and this area of the body. And he wasn't using the inhaler anymore. And he said, I was a miracle worker. And I feel like it's a miracle because these things are, you know, modern medicine doesn't have anything that that performs at this level. But to see him not use his inhaler and run and be okay was for me, you know, really eye opening as to how fascia works in the body and, and what we can accomplish through this practice. I have actually personal experience with, with that as well. I had a breast reduction when I was in my twenties and also prior to that breast reduction, because I was so big, of course, that was my posture to hide, to pull everything in and to not be that way. So now I have the surgery and now I have these scars gripping and adhering to my ribs. And I was a runner because at that time I was still really overweight. I was, you know, trying to exercise more and, and do things. And I needed that inhaler to get through a run. And once I started working those scars and releasing them from the rib cage, I'm like game changer. I didn't need that inhaler anymore. And I also yeah. stopped running because I realized that wasn't healthy for me, but, <laughs> <laughs> but thanks. That's a, that's a great thing to share. Well, and, and I'm not going to get into my story about that as well, because I mentioned this in a, in another discussion, but yeah, I had that chronic bronchitis in my lungs as well. And I was on two puffers. One was like a steroid puffer and one was, so if anybody's asked me if I've ever done steroids before, it's only been from that puffer. <laughs> 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 so it's um yeah so i had those two for months and months and i was having cough attacks and long story short within the first class of working in the sternum it was like the wheezing was gone pretty much 90 percent after that position i woke up the next day and then it was kind of there again then deanna told me like okay do the sternum again for about five minutes and i really focused on the exhalation like squeezing out my lungs as much as i could and it was people still don't believe me to this day but it's totally true because i didn't have it the following day it was gone that next day from just working the sternum and i was so blown away i'm like hey i thought this was just going to help me with bodybuilding and with like growing and symmetry this and that and then I realize this helps with everything else. And now I'm out of bodybuilding. It's just, it's amazing how everything works and how everything change and changes and how the body really does work and how efficient the body is at healing. If you just give it what it needs and that's just giving it self love and self care and working on the fascia system, giving it oxygen. So 
Yeah, it's it's amazing. It's it's so cool how people are calling you like a miracle worker because you're you're just giving them the the information. They're the miracle worker. Exactly. Each, indivi each individual is the miracle worker. We're just giving you guys the information and the process and the instruction to do it correctly, and then and then yeah, we're they're, they're we're the conduit for for them to be able to heal themselves, right? I don't believe exactly. that there. I I think everything is self healing. There's not necessarily mm -hmm. healers out there. We're just we're guides. We're conduits to to how you can heal, and your body wants to heal. When you create the proper conditions for the body to heal, it will heal. And I saw a lot of this in uh, Nicaragua at, um, at GLOW when people would come for wellness retreats. Not only did we incorporate the block therapy, but the nutrition aspect was also put into play, right? Eating detoxing foods, um, you know, practicing intermittent fasting and, and proper sleep, not having uh, even connecting to the internet at night and just having these elements put into play that – only magnified what block therapy can do in terms of detox effects. And we saw people, people usually come for, you know, seven to 10 days or so. And within the first few days, you have many healing crises, people just having these instant cha instantaneous changes in their body and detoxing. And it's incredible to see that, that, you know, when we create the the proper environment in our body nutritionally and, and with our physical practices, we create this incredible synergy. I've seen varicose veins disappear. Um, and, you know, I'm sure you, you all have seen this a lot too, but the cellulite disappear and start to make drastic changes in a very, very short amount of time. And, and Deanna's analogy with the ice cube is great because when that melting starts to happen, it happens quick. Mm -hmm. It happens quick. And I'm sure all of us personally, I have so many block therapy stories of myself, you know, things shifting or one pain going from one place to another and then disappearing. It's, it's uh, pretty incredible. But I think really, you know, we've, we've touched on this a lot, but overall block therapy gives us control of our life again. And we struggle with this day in and day out, whether it's at work, in our relationships with ourselves, we struggle for control. And block therapy is something that gives us control of our body and our mind. And it's, and it's how we create those miraculous results, being able to control it. When you can learn to control what your fascia is doing, everything else kind of comes along with that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, we have, oh, sorry, Quinn, go ahead. Well, no, I was, I was just going to say like, that's so true because when I, when I first came to realize all of this for myself from actually doing block therapy on my own and really starting this as a practice, I got to the point where I just wasn't like scared or worried anymore. I'm like, no matter what happens to me physically, I know I can heal myself. And that is the most empowering moment and realization that you will ever have. And when you go and, and we're all going to experience pain, we're all going to experience interesting times in our life, but it's just all about how we deal with it. And if you've done block therapy before, you, you know the power of it. Um, and that's just one of the most amazing things is just taking that whole fear factor out of the equation. Fear factor. <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably one of the biggest things for me from a general perspective because I can talk about bodybuilding. I can talk about all these other things. But when it comes down to just knowing that you're in control, that's like the most amazing thing anybody could ever ask for. Wow. Awesome. So Chris, I mean, we could, we could spend hours and hours and probably days mm -hmm. just having conversations <laughs> and we're definitely going to mm -hmm. have you back multiple times to uh, target different topics and stuff. But before we end here, is there any last thoughts that you would like to share with our listeners? And also what is it that you're doing? How can people find you? Sure. I, you know, just want everybody to know that there's nothing you cannot come back from. There is no end, right? There's nothing that you can't fix. There's nothing that you can't overcome. And I think many of us have had extremely hard challenges in our life, whether it's emotionally, physically, and yes, we're not all dealt the same hand, right? But whether, you know, it's, it's kind of like whether you make a hundred million dollars a year or, or $10,000 a year, we all have problems that are relatively the same. 
And this comes down to our health, our emotions, our relationships. And th there's one thing you can do is try to heal through those things. So it's really important to, to have the courage and the, the ability to recognize what you're going through. And when you can create awareness of your problem, that's when you can begin to fix it. And I think that is what's so beautiful about this practice is that it creates that awareness. Whether you, you might have not been so aware of it before, but once you start to dive in and see how it's physically affecting you, we can make that body-mind connection and begin to move through, begin to get through the pain, and begin to heal. And it's super, super important to not be afraid. And if you are afraid, it's okay. Fear is a natural part of life. But don't be scared to dive in. And we can apply that to many different things in life. But when it comes to healing and this practice, it's huge. So um, I'm always open for questions. I'm an open book, just like you two are. If anybody ever wants to reach me, you can find more information about my um, block therapy at blocktherapy.com forward slash Chris Prado. You can look me up on Facebook, Chris Prado. Uh, you can look me up on Instagram. It's Prado Moves is my Instagram name. And I'm always open to help. I'm always open to discussion. I love this. I love helping people. And you know, my, my path has only led me to want to take people down the same path and they can become their path of healing and almost this enlightenment that we get through taking our control back. It's never too late, no matter what age you are. Age is relative to the experiencer. So Wow. Thank you so Amazing. much. That was incredibly enlightening. Mm -hmm. And my heart just feels so open and warm. And I'm sure everybody <laughs> that's been listening is just really, really pleased that they've had this experience. Quinn, is there any last thoughts from you? That no, I think again, like we could, we could talk for literally hours and hours and days um, about so many different subjects and topics. So um, again, I just want to say thank you so much, Chris, for for being here and, and sharing like all of these things I, I wasn't even aware of. And your story has already like just from the comments and the questions have touched so many people. So again, I just want to thank you so much for being you um, and taking block therapy on as, as your own and really sharing this to everybody around you and as many people as you can reach to because you're an incredible instructor, you're an incredible human being. And um, yeah, I'm just so thankful that, that you're here. So yeah. Thank you, Quinn. All right. <laughs> and don't forget, um, people can get a free copy of your book as well, Deanna. Yes. Yes. So, so I'm going to have everything linked below um, this video. So again, thank you guys so much for all attending and listening to this discussion um, of the Fashion Masters. And of course, our guest is Chris Prado. All the information to learn more about Chris is going to be below. If you have any questions, any comments, again, you can, of course, post that below this YouTube video and you can reach out to Chris at any time. So thank you again all so much for being here. Have a fantastic day. We'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. And we'll see you then. Bye, everyone. Bye. Take care.